You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. Ted Liebman here, the voice of the OHL's Niagara Ice Dogs, and you're listening to OHL Overtime, an in-depth interview show highlighting the players, coaches, and broadcasters from around the Ontario Hockey League who make the league so great. Exclusively on the Armchair GM Sports Network, now, here's your program host, Brandon Caputo. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another installment of OHL Overtime right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Guys, make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at Armchair GM Pod as well. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and we're now on TikTok as well if you're uh, into that type of thing. Uh, We are available on all audio platforms wherever you get your podcasts at. We are available for you guys on demand in audio, so thank you very much. If you're listening to us right now uh, in audio form, and if you're enjoying the video version of the podcast, make sure you hit like, hit subscribe, smash that bell for all updates on video versions of podcasts that get released here on the YouTube channel in video form. So thank you very much for giving us some love over there. Today's episode, obviously, if you can see by the thumbnail, OHL Championship Series just wrapped up earlier this week between the London Knights and the Peterborough Peets. The Peets coming out on top. Winning in six games, so a uh, very exciting time for the Peterborough fans. Uh, first championship since the 2006 OHL championship. It was hard fought, but in the end, London, you know, just wasn't able to overcome losing their starting goaltender in Brett Brochu and having a younger lineup uh, out there. A lot of 05s and 06s playing for this London Knights team. We're going to get into the interviews very shortly here, but, you know, I think a team like London should be recognized for having a great season. Obviously went through some tragedy, uh, losing a player earlier this season and having the, the young team rally around that. I think they really exceeded some expectations. And with a young roster, they should be, you know, maybe better next year, losing a few uh, guys like Sean McGurr and Ryan Winterton um, and Brett Brochu. But being able to have a lot of their young core come back uh, will be an exciting team to watch going forward. But the London Knights, a team that did it by committee this year, not so much with uh, the, the, the star power, not a single 30 goal scorer for the London Knights. On the Peterborough Pete side, obviously, uh, getting through the top two teams in the Eastern Conference in the Ottawa 67s and the North Bay Battalion en route, uh, coming back in that North Bay series, actually winning game six and seven on the road to win the Eastern Conference and then getting it done here in six games uh, against the London Knights. Michael Simpson was incredible and that was awarded playoff MVP. So we're going to get to talk to him as well. A little bit of a preview of what we're going to discuss in today's show. We've got some great interviews lined up as always uh, on this show. We've got the radio voice for the London Knights, Mike Stubbs. Great conversation with him as well as uh, the TV play-by-play announcer uh, for London Knights on Rogers TV. That'd be Greg Sloan. So we'll get the London Knights side of things uh, from those two gentlemen there. And then on the Peterborough Pete side, we spoke to Pete Dalladay, who is the TV play-by-play voice for your TV for the Pete. So I get to talk to Pete as well. Also, we've got an interview with uh, the color commentator for the CHL and TSN. That'd be Mark Mathot, former NHL defenseman for uh, the Ottawa Senators and Dallas Stars. And then we'll finish off today's episode with the on-ice interviews during the celebration for the Peterborough Pete. So we've got head coach Rob Wilson. We've got general manager Mike Oak. And as well, the player lineup, we've got J.R. Avon, Michael Simpson, Brennan Othman, Tucker Robertson, Gavin White going back to back as an OHL champion with the Bulldogs last year and now winning it with the Peterborough Peets and Owen Beck as well. So those are the interviews that will be available for you guys throughout the episode. If you're watching on video, I'll have the timestamps for each interview. So if you guys want to skip towards a, a, to one of the certain interviews, you can do that, so all of that will be available for you guys in the video description on YouTube and in audio as well if you want to be able to skip towards some of the interviews that you're looking for in today's episode. So 
Without further ado, let's get, uh, we'll start off here with the longtime radio voice of the London Knights, and that would be Mike Stubbs. Please be joined now by longtime radio voice of the London Knights on 980 CFBL. That'd be the one and only Mike Stubbs. Mike, thanks so much for taking some time. Exciting time for the London Knights, getting back to the OHL Championship once again. First question for you, just where do you think that this, you know, team kind of ranks with some of those other great London Knights teams? They might not have, you know, the, the Mitch Marners, the, the Patrick Canes, and the Rick Nashes, but it seems like by committee this team lines 1-4 to four and 1-3 one, one to three on D-pair. They just can beat you any sort of way. Every once in a while, Brandon, something unexpected happens. And this maybe was one of those years that was unexpected. This team started 0-3-1. And they were having difficulty very early on in the year scoring. George Diaco came over. And it seemed like he was able to do the show what the coaches have been telling us on the ice. Because he came in and he played with the level that you have to play at in order to win. And after he arrived, the team reeled off a bunch of wins. They went 4-1-1 one, and one in their next six games. And they lost twice over a span of 23 games from late October into December. So pretty impressive to see what they did there. And they've been through one of the hardest times you can go through this season. And losing a teammate helped to galvanize this team because they had to be there for each other. They had to support each other. And so to see what they're doing now you you just as as I think fans or anyone who's been around the team you're just proud of this team you're proud of what they've been able to do it's it's pretty exceptional because they didn't have a 30 goal scorer this year right but it's one of those instances and maybe we saw it with a team like the Seattle Kraken in the NHL where you can't focus in on one guy or two guys because there's a whole bunch of guys that can do some damage Right, and piggybacking off what you just said there about the team coming together with that unfortunate circumstance earlier this season, do you think this might be, from the teams that you've been around, maybe the most tight-knit group, and you think that that maybe has led to them being so successful this year because they really had to rally around each other and with, with uh, that situation that happened? It's certainly one of them. Uh, all teams that get this far are as close as they come. This is why when you see teams that win a championship – players will move back to that town. They just want to be around that. They've just experienced something unlike anything they've ever experienced before. And so this is definitely one of those teams where they all get along, they always have, and that's almost a baton that gets passed by the London Knights where everybody is included. You don't have cliques of, well, the young guys do this together and the older guys do this together. They all do everything together. Everybody's included. You don't hear the word rookie around this team because it's, it's not like that. You've made the team, you're a part of the team, and that's important. Right, and getting engraved in that London Knight way type of uh, you know scenario and kind of mindset, I guess. There's a lot of 05s and 06s that are playing significant roles on this team. You know, can you speak to some of those younger players? You know, the Denver Barkies, the Easton Cowans, Sam Dickinson, getting him in the trade with Niagara in the preseason, and a couple of those other guys really stepping up as younger players. And like you mentioned, they're expected to not be no, be seen as a young player, but known as people that are going to be able to produce uh, night in and night out and here on the biggest stage in the OHL championship. And one of the things around this organization, players are never rushed. Dale Hunter is very careful about putting players in positions where he knows that they're ready, where they have an opportunity to succeed. You don't want to see somebody going into a situation where they're not ready if you can avoid it in any way. And so Denver Barkey and Easton Cowan coming into their second year you wouldn't count on these guys to be scorers, and they have been. And at the beginning of the year, again, brought along slowly, but with more showing at practice and more showing in games comes more responsibility. And you've seen both of them climb up the charts of whoever you want to look at in terms of scouting reports and in terms of mock drafts. And who knows, Easton Cowan at the beginning of the year wouldn't be talked about. And now people are wondering, could he sneak into the first round? Right. When is an NHL team going to pull the trigger to say, if we don't do this now, somebody else might. So we better do this. And Denver Barkey has been a guy who played at the top prospects game. He's been on that radar. So it's been incredible to see their growth and the fact that these two are just relentless. How would you like to be a player on an opposing team and you have the puck in your own zone, and one of them's buzzing around you, and you get away from them, and the other one's up underneath you, and eventually you're just losing the puck, and then they're making a play at the net. It happens over and over again. And Sam Dickinson, 
how many times do you hear people look at him on the ice and say, how old is he again? Has he not turned 17 yet? Are you sure he's not 18? Because he sure looks like a 17 or 18 or, I don't know, 25-year-old. He has such poise. His shot is incredible, the torque that he gets on it. And again, it was one of those things where Dale Hunter did not put him into the positions we see him in right now at the beginning of the year. He wasn't playing power play. You want to make sure he's ready for that. And growing along, and this guy learns, and all three of them, you can't keep them off the ice. Yeah. So they're always out there working on their game over and over and over, getting as many reps as they can, and it's paid off. Yeah, and the progression of Oliver Bonk too as well, junior B player last year, making a big impact this year. I want to quickly touch on the goaltenders because that's a big thing in this series. Obviously, Brett Brochu going out in the Western Conference Final. They were able to, to pull through and, and still win the West uh, with Bowen and Wilmore here. Going by committee here, what do you think that the London Knights just how, how they've kind of went about their goalie situation and how do you think that you know the coaching staff have prepared Bowen and Wilmore for these spots with obviously their starter Brett Brochu being out? Yeah, seeing Brett Brochu go down, if you wanted to award a playoff MVP through two rounds, a game, and a bit, it probably would have gone to Brett Brochu. He had four shutouts. He'd been the goaltender of the week twice. He was he was playing out of out of this world. Uh, Brett Brochu is a great goaltender. He's been the goaltender of the year. He was playing as well as he ever has. And for Zach Bowen to be able to come in and help the Knights knock off the Sarnia Sting, he allowed two goals, one goal, and then no goals to start the championship series all in a row. Uh, that's an impressive performance. And sometimes a team just needs to change things up. Dale Hunter has a couple of moments that he's, he's kind of let us in on over the years. And there's two that stand out. And it goes to, as a coach, seeing, okay, things aren't going the way we want them to. What can I do just to, to change things up, try something new? And one of those moments was in the Memorial Cup final in 2016, where Christian Dvorak had been going out and taking defensive zone faceoffs, and then had been going off to the bench. He was playing with Matthew Kachuk and Mitch Marner at the time. And Knights are down 2-1. Dale's looking, they're coming off the final TV timeout. And he says, you know, I just wanted to, to do something, get something going. So he says, hey, Devo, stay out. And Christian Dvorak stays on the ice with Max Jones and Aaron Barisha, and the play goes up the ice after Christian Dvorak won the faceoff. He won most of them. And the puck goes into the corner. It winds up being centered. And who's standing there who shouldn't have been there? Because it wasn't his line. It wasn't his turn. Christian Dvorak, and he ties the game. And then there was another time at the World Junior Hockey Championship in the gold medal game where it's tied 3-3 with Russia. Russia is coming. And Dale's thinking, i got to do something. i got to change something up. So he looks down the row of players in front of him and he sees Akil Thomas and he thinks Akil has scored some really big goals against us this guy can handle big moments so Akil get ready Akil jumps over the boards quick up blue line to blue line he goes in scores what would hold up as the <laughs> gold medal winning goal and those were just moments of let's change things up so when Owen Wilmore was recalled from Junior B, where he'd gone seven games with Stratford in the Sutherland Cup Championship Series, it wasn't, hey, come on in and put on the pads and sit on the bench. It's, you know, be ready, just in case. You never know. And through four games of the series, the Knights were down 3-1. Dale may have been looking to see, okay, what can we change up? Well, let's put Owen Wilmore in and see what happens. And the Knights got a Game 5 win. Yeah, they definitely did. And being based at Niagara, we definitely remember that Akil Thomas golden goal. <laughs> we also remember the 2012 and 2016 championships that the London Knights won, but, you know, it, that's okay. Last question for Mike Stubbs. Um, I asked Greg Sloan on the TV side the same question, you know, just, you know, when you look at this London Knights team, it might even be better next year because you look at, you know, they have a lot of returning players. Do you think that maybe with this core that they have right now, most of it coming back that, you know, this – London Knights group if they don't get it done this year in the OHL championship they might have another another kick at the can or two uh, in the near future uh, when you go back and look at it maybe maybe uh, the one thing I think you learn in sports if you hang out long enough is when you get an opportunity to do something you need to do it because it's easy to think oh look next year we're going to be as strong or the year after we'll be even stronger and then 
you look around and you think, well, it, it didn't happen that year. It didn't happen the next year. How come? And it's all kinds of different things. When you get that opportunity, you need to seize it. The Knights will return six defensemen next year. They will return all of the players we talked about. Oliver Bonk and Sam Dickinson are part of those six defensemen. Easton Cowan and Denver Barkey, they have some players whose names junior hockey doesn't really know about yet, and Sam O'Reilly and Will Nickel, and they'll learn those names. Those are players who will jump into the lineup, and that leadership will be passed on from Sean McGurn and George Diaco, who will graduate. It'll be passed to somebody else, but that's kind of the way that it goes. Zach Bowen being able to get in and go through what he's gone through, that's going to be helpful for him. And so, yeah, this team should be very good, but, you know, they'll, uh, they'll have some competition. The Saginaw Spirit already look really good, and there'll be a few other teams that rise up, and that's junior hockey. Things go quick, so, you know, you got to be ready. Thank you very much to Mike Stubbs, legendary voice on London Knights Radio, uh, for that great uh, analysis of the London Knights and, you know, a team that's a perennial playoff contender and getting back to this to the OHL championship for the first time since 2016 when they took down the Niagara Ice Dogs. So again, I think this London Knights team will see what what happens, but I think they got a bright future as well. Uh, obviously, well coached under Dale Hunter, um, and and a lot of good young pieces there to build around. So next interview, we're going to jump into the TV play by play announcer for the Peterborough Peets on your TV, and that would be Pete Dalladay. So here is our discussion with Pete. Joined now by the TV play by play broadcaster for the Peterborough Peets on your TV, Pete Dalladay. Pete, thanks a lot for taking some time with us today. Uh, exciting time for the Peterborough Peets. It's been a heck of a season so far. Being able to get to the the OHL championship just incredible time and, and the team finally started to play well getting into the playoffs here and after the trade deadline a little bit of a lull but taking out the top two teams in the Eastern Conference North Bay and the Ottawa 67s must have been something that you know the Pete's fans were excited about very excited and it's you know growing up in Peterborough I was kind of spoiled because it seemed like the Pete's got to the OHL championship all the time they got to it three years in a row back in the late 70s, early 80s when I was a small kid. Then 89 when I was kind of more the player's age. And then 93 when I first started working with the team. Uh, Dick Taw was coaching then. And then a couple years after that in 96, and we hosted the Memorial Cup. So my point, I guess, being is we were really spoiled for a long, long time. So since it's been 17 years, you're, you're right. There is a buzz. There's an excitement because it's been so long since, since we've been there. Um, you know, my youngest child is... is uh, 17 and he wasn't born the last time the Pete's he was born that year in 2006 so it, it's it's wild and the buzz is amazing and uh it feels good to be going to the rink again and just like uh t-shirt weather basically yeah. yeah for sure and I and I asked the general manager Mike Oak about this uh, last round uh, for our Eastern Conference recap that 2019-2020 season great team for the Peterborough Peets unfortunately get shut down with the pandemic and then they really kind of had to reload uh, last season trading away Mason McTavish was difficult but uh, kind of recouping the way the ebbs and flows of junior hockey but uh, getting the Peets back to this level after you know kind of missing out on the season that they had a lot of high hopes for with the Nick Robertsons and then based in Niagara I remember when they went and got Akil Thomas and and some of those great players that they had just uh, you know what do you think you've been covering the team for a long time so uh, looking back on that and then finding finally getting the opportunity now to uh, to really showcase uh, Peterborough uh, making it uh, this far and showcasing why it's still uh, one of the great uh, historical ranks. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, um, we'll never know. I mean, no one will know how uh, well the Peets were going to do that year or Ottawa. I just know that they played Ottawa very well that year. So I, I had confidence that they were going to go on a good run. But to see Hunter Jones here the other night and Akeel Thomas before the game brought back memories of that team, even though it was just a couple years ago. Um, but this team is is probably deeper than that team when you have uh, the Owen Becks and the Chase Delmans and J.R. Avons, when they can have a night off the odd time and other guys are picking it up like an Othman or whatever the case may be or Hayes, that, that's a lot of depth. So I think this team is actually deeper than that team you're referring to. Goaltending is a bit of a wash. Hunter Jones was having a great year. Michael Simpson is having a good year. There are a lot of similarities there. Coaching staff is the same. So uh, we feel a little ripped off from, from that COVID year, but 19 other teams probably were a, a, as well. And they went all in, as you said. They cashed all their chips in for Akeel Thomas and a couple other guys. So I feel bad for the teams that did that because really there was no compensation for that. It was just life, right? That's just the way they rolled. So Mike Oak had to work hard and, and dig deep and, and come up with the team that he has here now. 
And when you talk about junior hockey, it's important to have those local connections. And just how important has it been to have guys like J.R. Avon and Chase Stillman growing up together around this area, being Peterborough Pete's now, and, and you know, really having that, uh, that hometown content that I think is, is key for every team. But we can have two stars like that uh, be uh, local, co local players. How, just how important has that been? And seeing those guys develop and grow up uh, as young men now, uh, you know, making it to this level and going to be OHL or NHL players uh, it, in the near future yeah I, th I think it's really important I think from a marketing perspective first of all I think it puts people in the seats in October and November to come see the kids that they played with or coached or whatever so the more local players you can have I think it's important I think there's been a couple teams here in the past where they had no local players and that could be just timing or whatever the case may and you can't get them all I know Jeff Tui who's sitting next door always said well we can't get everybody we can't get every local player right and that and that's the truth some sometimes they get scooped up but you know uh, Chase Stillman and JR as you said they just have that natural chemistry even though they're not always on the same line anymore when they're out there they're fun to watch and, and you can even throw Owen back into the mix there too because he's from Port Hope and and really that's as close as you're going to get to to Peterborough for a hometown for Owen so yeah three Peterborough kids that are really big factors especially in this series it's it's kind of fun to watch and at the end of the day it it adds to the excitement because everyone can say well I know Chase I know JR I went to school with them wherever the case may be so I'd love the OHL I know it never happened I'd love for them to have like a minimum you know you gotta have minimum three players from your hometown which could be tough in some centers but uh, we're pretty lucky in Peterborough we produce some good minor players. Pete Dalladay the uh, TV broadcaster for the Peterborough Pete's is with us. Pete I want to ask you about um, Sean Spearing and you know one of the unsung heroes sometimes you know you see these guys that are captains of teams and they're not necessarily you know the the top scorer or the top you know point producing defenseman on the team what has it been about Sean Spearing that has really made him you know so loved and beloved within that locker room and in this community as the captain of the Pete's as a guy that's just a heart and soul type player obviously blocking a shot off his face in game seven in the east final to win that game over North Bay still recovering from that but uh, what is it about Sean Spearing that makes him so special and why he has the C on his chest yeah it's a great question because uh, I didn't know up until this season I mean Sean was one of those guys that came in during the COVID year got shut down no year after that he comes back and all of a sudden he's like the elder statesman of the team and they make him team captain they had to make somebody captain that had been around and I'm like what's the deal with this guy because I hadn't really seen much of him didn't know much of him didn't seem like a captain to me just from looking you know I'm not on the road anymore with him I don't see them on the road or on the bus but I'm like what is it with this guy and I know Rob Wilson from day one was a huge Sean Spearing fan and it took me a long time to go okay and it, and it, and it could maybe even deep into this season I'm like okay now I know and it's the shot blocking it's his kind of like happy-go-lucky sort of attitude I think that's what the rest of the guys like in a captain now uh, as opposed to 20 years ago when you always needed sort of that hard nose sort of uh, in your face almost like a third coach yeah. to be your captain now I think it's a different style and he's he's kind of a modern day captain and I've, I've I'll admit I've grown to really like Sean Spearing whereas in the past I wasn't even 100% sure whether they should bring him back as, as an over, over age D captain I'm like what is he going to bring to the table well now we know now everyone knows he, he brings a lot they, they follow Sean around and and just sitting on the bench with a, a, a jaw that's wired shut is, is quite the achievement, so uh, good on him. And calling these games all year long, Pete, just uh, what has it been about Rob, Rob Wilson's system that has really gotten these guys to buy in? He said it in post games. He can be miserable sometimes with the way that he uh, you know, in, tries to instill his system into these guys. And when you bring in so much NHL talent, trying to put piece them together sometimes might not gen generate into being the best team. But he's somehow been able to get these guys to play as a unit, especially as the season's gone on here and in the playoffs. They've ele elevated it to another level here. But uh, what have you seen from Rob Wilson's system that's made them so successful? With this, this year and getting all these great individuals to play together. Yeah, you know, Rob is, well, he's been there, done that, right? He's won an OHL championship right here, in, you know, with the Peets years ago now, but he's just consistent, you know? I, I think it's kind of like stick to the plan. Yeah, he changed his lines up, and there was times we'd come into a home game, and, okay, who's playing with who here tonight? But other than that, I think his system ha hasn't changed. He, he didn't panic, uh, even when the team was struggling to find their identity, to find that chemistry after the, the Owen Beck and the Othmans and, and the Whites came in at that deadline. It's like, what, what is going on here? But they never strayed away from it even their power play you know it hasn't been great in the playoffs but they've stuck with it and they haven't really panicked so um, 
yeah, he can be miserable at times. He admits that, as you mentioned. But uh, I tell you what, I know after game two, they came home. He lives out on Shemong Lake uh, in the beautiful core this year. And a buddy of mine who's buddies with him sent me a picture. He's just on the boat, relaxing in the sunshine <laughs> on Sunday. And you know what? And, and the guys go out to the lake, out to his place sometimes. And at the end of the day, he treats every one of those um, young men like his sons, I guess, which some of which our coaches do. So his bark is probably a little louder than his bite. Is that is that the expression? I don't know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's a good dude. Thank you very much to Pete Dalladay. That definitely was exciting to be at the PMC uh, for that celebration and having the community come together to support that team once again. It was definitely great to hear some history from Pete about uh, what how he grew up around the Pete's organization and great history that they've had there. And obviously now becoming OHL champions for a 10th time for their franchise. So thank you to Pete. Does a great job with you, the your TV coverage. Peterborough Pete's and shout outs to Dan Malta as well, who I got to speak to a lot during the series as well who does the hosting uh, for their for their broadcast so great job to them all season long and without further ado let's get to another tv broadcaster this time greg sloan who, who's been doing play-by-play for the london knights on rogers tv since 2007 and a great conversation with greg about the history of the knights and, and their championship teams over the years joined now by london knights play-by-play voice for rogers tv since 2007 that'd be greg sloan greg thanks so much for taking some time with us i know it's an exciting time for london getting back to the ohl championship for the first time since that uh, 2016 season being based at Niagara, I remember that well uh, with the sweep over the Ice Dogs, so thanks for that. But what has it been like to have this team be back in the OHL Championship? They've been consistently a playoff team, but haven't made it out of the second round. Yeah, it's uh, for the uh, London Knights, they uh, haven't, you're right, they haven't made it past the second round uh, since they won the OHL Championship and on to the Memorial Cup in 16 out in Red Deer. They've come close a couple of times getting into the, uh, the final uh, kind of two disappointing uh, seasons when uh, Guelph, they had Guelph up, remember, 3 nothing, and I believe it was 19, 2019, and that strong Guelph team came back and beat them uh, three, four games straight to beat them out. And then uh, last year, of course we had the COVID, but then last year the Kitchener Rangers in the first round beat the Knights in seven games in an overtime goal right here at the Gardens, and uh, you don't see that too often here at the Gardens. So... And of course, you mix in two or th- two years of COVID, it, uh, it soon goes by. But the feel is always the feel around the uh, uh, London area and uh, especially Budweiser Gardens with 9,000 uh, plus in the rink every night. And uh, it's a uh, junior market to uh, reckon with, if you will. <laughs> And you mentioned that, uh, you know, having 9,000 fans in the building, you know, that COVID shutdown year, they had they were 45 and 15 before that shutdown. Just uh, do you think that they were really poised for another deep run there? Or how do you think yeah. the team was going to do? And obviously they didn't get to play out the rest of that season. Yeah, I was in 2020. You're absolutely right. And they were poised. Uh, them and uh, Ottawa were the two top teams that year, at least in the regular season. We've seen that differ this year, but... Uh, in the regular season, uh, Ottawa and London seemed to be the cream of the crop in the uh, league. And there was one game back in February, I remember that year. It's funny how you remember things, but uh, I, that uh, London won that game. McMichael scored with about uh, a minute left in Ottawa just to kind of say, hey, we're for real too. And we're kind of thinking that possibly that London and uh, Ottawa would have met up in 2020, the year uh, they shut things down. So. You know, it's tough, eh? You have a good team, you're peaking there, and then all of a sudden you got to rebound and build again, And but the Knights just seem to reload. They don't uh, build yeah. again. Then all of a sudden it's 23, and here we are again. Yeah, I was looking at the stats. It's pretty incredible. They haven't had less than 39 wins uh, since that, uh, that, that Memorial Cup season. They've just been consistently a playoff team in and out. But uh, we talked about this year's team a little bit. You know, they, they don't have maybe necessarily some of the great superstars that have come through the London Knights over the past, but just the depth and the solid team that, that these guys have this year. What do you think it is about this depth that uh, really has, has catapulted them uh, to the OHL Championship and winning the Western Conference? Well, the first is Dale's a very good coach. Uh, he can get the best out of kids. Nobody's bigger than the game. So f- he preaches defense first. You wouldn't think that, but he preaches defense uh, first. Then he added the uh, three kids from uh, Hamilton. I thought that was a big move by Mark and Dale to uh, bring some experience, some pedigree, championship 
pedigree into the locker room. Remember, this squad's pretty young here. I think they might even be better next year when you really right. start thinking about it. Uh, they were built. They were built probably for next year. But again, Mark added in those, those three kids from Hamilton and Ryan Winterton and Humphreys and of course George Diaco and the London native. And all of a sudden things turned. Uh, Rochu came back healthy. All right, they added a, another solid goaltender, what we've seen in Zach Bowen. And then now it's by committee. So uh, with the preaching of defense first, plus the pedigree of the experience, plus plus the fact they, uh, they draft skill. That's all they do is draft skill. The younger kids are starting to come to fruition. And, uh, you know, like Barkey and Cowan and, you know, the Landon Sims of the world, they, uh, they're coming to fruition. So it's just an all-around team effort. Uh, again, going back to Dale, he, you know, he marks what the team is. He knows right. what the team is. So here's what he does to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, to make sure that they go, you know, best as they can. You take a look at that uh, Sarnia series, you know, like honest to God, like Sarnia had was loaded yeah. with top-end talent. But when you get smothered, <laughs> you get smothered. <laughs> and that's Dale Hunter coaching. Yeah, and you speak to Dale's <laughs> system, just, you know, those three rookies that are, have had a, a big impact, Cowan, uh, uh, Bonk, and then Dickinson, getting him from the yeah. Ice Dogs um, after the whole uh, uh, situation there. Just talk about, you know, Dale's trust in those younger players and being able to develop them so quickly and have give, have give them a lot of confidence being able to play as 16-year-olds in the lineup. Yeah, you know, you earn a spot on the London Knights. Uh, you know, if you're playing, age has something to do with it, but not a lot to do with that. And that's evident with uh, Sam Dickinson. Uh, as you know, this kid's the real deal. <laughs> if we see him past 18, that'll be incredible in my mind. So, uh, but he's, he's earned the spot. He hasn't disappointed uh, anybody here and certainly plays like, a, plays like a veteran. So what Dale does usually, he just kind of squeezes them in, just giving them enough experience. Not only the OHL, but it's the whole environment right. of the NHL field. The again, the 9,000 plus, the yeah. uh, the hype, the media hype, as you know, around here is crazy. It's like mini Leafland, if you will. <laughs> and uh, so he just gives them a taste of what you know, kind of what the big leagues feel like from the OHL level. And uh, he squeezes in, unless you're a, a gifted, outstanding kid like, uh, like Sam Dickinson, he's going to play, you're going to get a regular shift. Right. <laughs> so last question for you, Greg, just uh, where would you, it's hard to rank teams because it's always different, but when you look at the 2012 M Cup team, the 2016 team that won the OHL championship, um, you know, where do you think that this team ranks? Obviously, maybe not the high-end scoring that those teams had, but just the depth. And you said, you know, playing as a structured team. How do you think that this team, if they do make it to the Memorial Cup, would rank up to those other teams that uh, were so great for London? I'm frankly a little surprised with this year's team. Okay, I thought that they were going to be lacking in scoring. Okay, but again, some of the kids have come through with scoring. Again, going back to the three coming over from Hamilton. Uh, this team, like I said, is a bit of a surprise in the sense of the build that they were building for next year. Right. Right? So it kind of reminds me, you know, it really kind of reminds me of this team, reminds me of the 2012 team. They were in the same boat, if you will. You know, they were going to, knew they were going to be good. They're going to build for the next year, which they won the Cup in the 13. And, but they end up <laughs> going to the Memorial Cup in 12. Very, very similar, hungry young kids with spotted veteran leadership to lead them the way. And of course, we come back to Dale's coming. So ranking them up against this, I compare them to the 2012 team uh, from dead on. Yeah. 2016 team, can't beat that team with Marner to Chuck. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Dvorak <laughs> with over like 300 and whatever points they had. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty incredible. And Niagara lost both those series to the, uh, to, uh, the London Knights. Yeah. So we remember those teams vividly in 2012 and 2016. Just, uh, uh, a little piece of history, if you will. Today, what, May 13th. Am I correct saying that? Yes. Uh, May 13th on uh, 2013 was when... London wasn't playing Niagara. They, <laughs> they were playing the Barry Colts. Yeah. 
0.4 seconds remaining in the game. That's when Bor Hovat uh, scored that winning goal. I don't know oh. if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I do, yeah. Thank you very much to Greg Sloan, the TV play-by-play -play announcer for the London Knights on Rogers TV. Great to, to talk with, uh, with Greg. And uh, they do a great job uh, for the London Knights TV broadcast. And it's been exciting to see the Knights, you know, get back to that. Uh, those those winning ways, winning the Western Conference and coming up just short in the OHL final. But this team, uh, as Greg says, you know, should be looked at next year as a contending team. Uh, once again, we'll see the moves that they make in the offseason. So thank you very much to Greg Sloan there. With that said, we're going to take a break on today's show and we're going to come back with the interview with Mark Mathot for the CHL on TSN. And then we'll finish off today's episode uh, with with the on ice championship interviews with the Peterborough Pete's players uh, and staff. So stay right here. We'll be right back on OHL Overtime right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Experience a new way to play daily fantasy sports and esports on Thrive Fantasy. Thrive's game concept revolves around player props, which are simple over unders on player stats. There are contests for traditional sports, including the NFL, NBA, MLB, PGA, and Cricket, as well as esports titles including CSGO, Dota 2, League of Legends, and more coming soon. Here's how to play. Choose your lineup of over-unders for top-tier athletes that have the biggest impact on the game. Each prop has a fantasy point total based on how likely it is to hit. The more points the selection is worth, the riskier it is. Rack up the most points and win a share of the prize pool. Bribe is awarded over $2 million in cash. So come and prop up today. You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network, the Niagara region's best local source for North American sports podcasting coverage. By sports fans, for sports fans. Welcome back to our OHL Championship Series episode right here on OHL Overtime and the Armchair GM Sports Network. Guys, if you're enjoying the video version of the podcast so far, or the audio version for that matter, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, smash that bell, or give us some love on whatever uh, platform you're listening to us right now. We'd really appreciate that if you're enjoying the content. So with that said, we're going to jump into our next interview, which happens to be with uh, the color commentator for the CHL on TSN and former NHL defenseman Mark Mathot, uh, getting his thoughts on, on, you know, transitioning as an NHL player to a broadcaster and how that has been for him uh, going into his junior career. I won a Memorial Cup with the London Knights back in the day as well. And then I end up with asking him uh, what it was like to play alongside Eric Carlson during that uh, Norris Trophy season that he had with the Ottawa Senators. But some great insight uh, from Mark Mathot and um, him and Victor Finley cover the games uh, for the CHL on TSN uh, for those broadcasts. So uh, it's been uh, cool to uh, get to know them as well uh, throughout uh, the championship series there. And as they move on to the Memorial Cup uh, for the uh, for the CHL and TSN's coverage. So here is the color commentator for the CHL and TSN and as well uh, for the Ottawa Senators for TSN. That would be Mark Mathot. Pleased to be joined now by the color commentator for CHL and TSN and as well for the Ottawa Senators. He is former NHLer Mark Mathot. Mark, thanks so much for taking some time. Exciting time here with uh, the OHL Championship. I know you had a great junior career as well. Played for the London Knights, won a Memorial Cup. What has it been like to now you know, go to that other side and cover it as a broadcaster? Well, it's weird and, and I think a big challenge for me kind of stepping into that media side, as we say, the dark side when you're a hockey player is trying to manage how to critique players and, and analyze the game without, you know, being a little too harsh and trying to toe that middle line where you're not too biased either. But uh, I'm, I'm having so much fun doing it. And these junior games, for me at least, are very special because I get a chance to go back into these old buildings that I used to play in. And particularly here in London, for me, it's going to be a real cool evening to cover this game. Um, you know, obviously the series may come to an end tonight here, being that it's 3-1 for the Peets, but we'll see what happens. 
And, you know, just being back in, in a junior rink, obviously the, the Budweiser Gardens is, you know, top notch. It's almost like an NHL rink itself. But just, uh, you know, from, from being back in junior hockey, just what are some memories that, you know, when you look at it that you take away from, from your junior career? Obviously the Mem Cup, but just uh, what are some memories that you, that you took from your junior career as you transitioned to a National Hockey League player? Well, I think I was lucky to play here. And, I mean, that is not a slight against any other team in the league, obviously. But, I mean, having an opportunity here to play in London in the first year – in the John Labatt Center, which is what it was named at the time, uh, back in 0203. And um, so my first year was the first year of this building and it was an NHL style game, right? And being able to come in with some pretty good teams. I mean, my second season, I believe we were first in the CHL all year. And then finally, my third year, we won the Memorial Cup in 05. So um, a lot of NHL style experience come along the way here, playing in front of big crowds, having guys like Dale Hunter and, and, and Mark Hunter, obviously spearheading that ship. So uh, it was, it's been a great experience. And for you, you know, you haven't been out of the league for too long. So how has that, you know, transition been? And when did you really think that you were going to try to transition uh, after your playing career was done into maybe a coaching role or, you know, deciding to, to go on the broadcasting route? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when you retire, just before you retire, everybody always tries to warn you how difficult the transition is because you're doing this your entire life. And all of a sudden you lose your identity and, and no, one's to, no one's there to tell you what to do anymore, where to be at what time, because of course hockey's very strict like a lot of other professional sports. But um, that first year in retirement was very challenging for me and my family, to be quite honest. And then um, eventually got into doing a little bit of a podcast and then that led me into getting my TSN job. And um, yeah, it's, it's something that I, I always preach to players, try to find something that you want to do when that time does come, because it is inevitable. Father time is undefeated, uh, but uh, again, it could not have worked out better for me because it's very casual, and I'm still passionate about the game, and it allows me to keep a foot in the door. Yeah, I was going to say, is it, is it weird, you know, when you're getting ready for the game and not having, you know, the game prep, having to do the, the broadcasting prep and everything that goes into that, and, you know, you're still here a couple hours before the game and still doing the mental preparation, but it's a little bit different, is it not? Yeah, it's, it's different. Um, certainly the physical aspect is gone, which is nice. I, I don't miss the grind of playing 82 games, especially at the NHL level with all the travel. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the dinners out with the guys and being at the rink on practice days. But for me and many other players, you know, game, games can get very stressful. And, um, you know, the same applies to these OHL kids here or in the CHL for that matter. It's a professional style format, and uh, it's, a, it's a tall ask for a lot of these young, I don't want to call them kids, but they're teenagers. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they have to juggle school and, and of course, performing at a high level. So, um, you know, you grow up real quick in this line of work. And uh, just from a player's perspective, perspective real, real quick, um, you know, talk about the, the bright lights being here now with TSN covering the games in Canada. It's uh, broadcasting the United States on NHL Network too. So these kids, you know, they, they have all that extra pressure of nationally televised audiences in Canada and the United States watching them. And for a lot of these guys that are drafted, showcasing for their NHL teams and for the fans that, uh, you know, cheer for those teams that hopefully they can down the road become NHL players. So if you were a player right now getting prepped for this game, you know, what would you be telling the guys in the room? And, and if you were London, you know, you're down 3-1 in the series, so you've got a lot of work to do. So how, how do you just kind of go through the motions of leading up to this game? Well, you, yeah, there's a lot of pressure, right? You mentioned the bright lights, all the exposure. And, you know, we were, we were sort of familiar with that my last year in London because it was the NHL lockout year. So right. we had that much more added attention on us throughout that season. And um, I think for me, you, you just get kind of lost in the moment, right? You try not to pay too much attention. Now it's different with these kids now because they all have cell phones. And they have social media and they can look they can look themselves up online, which I always recommend not to do. Uh, but but no, I mean, you know, these these kids are they, they're, they're very mature, you know, for their age. And between that mixed in with a lot of good leaders in the dressing room, a lot of experienced coaches as well, kind of leading the leading the ship there. I think they're in good hands. I think it ultimately just comes down to keeping your emotions in check for London tonight, making sure you're just focused on winning one period at a time. Right. You don't want to look too far ahead because it can look pretty daunting when you're down 3 one. Former NHLer Mark Mathot's with us. Last question. It's the hardest hitting question I've got for you in this whole uh, discussion, Mark. You know, you played with Eric Carlson, won a Norris Trophy what, playing alongside of him. You know, what was that, you know, moment like playing alongside somebody like that who's probably going to win his second Norris now yep. uh, with San Jose and, you know, being his D partner, you know, being more the defensive guy, being able to have him go up and, and do his thing offensively. What was that experience like? Because a lot, not a lot of people, you know, I feel like give you the recognition that you, might, that you should maybe get with uh, playing alongside Eric Carlson. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, people flatter me a lot at home, so I'm lucky <laughs> in that regard, but Eric's a special breed. There's no question. 
And, and you know what? Hockey is about finding a role, especially at the pro level. You know, a lot of these players we're watching right now in the OHL, maybe a goal scorers, maybe a checker, I don't know, but the roles can, can change significantly to adapt to that next game because you got to remember the pool is that much larger once you get right. to the pro level, right? You're competing against kids from all over the world vying for those same 700 limited jobs at the NHL level. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's sticking with it. It's constantly progressing your game. And that was something that I was able to do. And, it, and, and my role was simple, right? It was just protecting him and making sure that I was complimenting him. And that was something that I took great pride in. Thank you very much to Mark Mathot for taking some time with us there. Great insight from him and cool to, you know, get that perspective of, you know, what it was like as a player now transitioning to a broadcaster, um, getting prepared for a championship game. So thank you very much to uh, Mark Mathot and hopefully we can talk to him again in the future. Now we're going to get to the final portion of today's show and that is going to be the on ice uh, celebratory interviews with the Peterborough Peets right after winning uh, the OHL championship right on the ice. So we've got Plenty of interviews for you lined up. Uh, let me just give you a quick rundown here. Mike Oak, the general manager of the Peterborough Peets, Rob Wilson, the head coach, and player interviews from J.R. Avon, Michael Simpson, Brennan Othman, Tucker Robertson, Gavin White, and Owen Beck. So again, all of the uh, timestamps for the interviews uh, will be in the description below here on YouTube and as well in audio form. So here they are uh, to finish off today's episode, the championship uh, winning Peterborough Peets, your 2023 OHL champions advancing to the Memorial Cup in Kamloops, British Columbia. Here with head coach Rob Wilson, OHL champion, coach now. Rob, can you just, you came back here in 2018. Was this what you guys envisioned? I know in 2019, 2020, the pandemic shutdown year, you really thought that that was going to be a year for your team. Didn't get, didn't get a chance to showcase what you could do. Coming back here with redemption, just how big was that? Yeah, you know, it hurt. We, we really felt, we had great battles with Ottawa at the time. And we really felt in, in a series we could maybe take them. They were a great team, take nothing from them. But we just felt that we had a great opportunity. We were big and heavy. And when COVID hit, it hurt. I'm not going to lie. It, 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 it really stung for a few months. And uh, tough to get over. And then we said, OK, you know what? Lick our wounds. We did that. And we said, OK, we got to get right back on the horse and build something. And that's what we planned on doing. And, and that's what's happened. A lot of homegrown talent here, J.R. Avon, Chase Stillman. You know, just how important was that for you guys to, in your coaching staff, to really grow those players into impact players, along with the guys that you acquired, to, to make sure that you had the organizational depth to go out and, and make, a, make a run like this? Yeah, I mean, both those kids are homegrown kids, and they're both awesome kids. They work hard. They're great players. But being from here, it's got to be even more special for them, right? And, and they played unbelievable. They were, they were great in so many different areas of the ice and happy for them and, and, and they were such a big part of it. How, ex how excited were you to be able to do it at home at the PMC? I know you wanted to win game five, but coming back here, hearing Glorious, having the, the sold out crowd, I know you talked last series about just how great this rink is for junior hockey. Just how much, you know, just juice did that give you guys on the bench and just being able to soak in the moment? Yeah, I was, you know what, it was, uh, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to win Friday. But London were better than us. They deserve to win Friday. And we said, okay, we're not going back to London. We had the same mentality we had going in. Okay, we are going to North Bay. Well, this one, we're not going back to London. That's the mentality we took in. And Michael Simpson, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak about him. Just talk about winning M playoff MVP. I know you had some great scorers, but just how much of the, of, of the backbone of the team was he throughout the uh, season? He was great. Zimmer was um, Zimmer has been great all year. Uh, he's a great kid, and he's so well respected by his teammates. Never puts the blame on anyone else, takes responsibility if he doesn't feel he plays good. And he just did just a phenomenal job, especially tonight. It was unreal. And last question for you. You know, you were down in that North Bay series, but your your confidence never wavered. You talked about we're going back to North Bay. You know, we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna make this run. You take out the two top teams in the Eastern Conference in North Bay and Ottawa, and then take down a perennial, you know, playoff contender, championship contender like London Knights, great coach team. Just talk about the grind of getting through the last three series here, really taking out the best teams to, to win this championship. Yeah, we probably, you couldn't make a tougher road for ourselves. Uh, we played four great teams. London's unbelievable. I mean, you know, Dale's got so much experience, does such a great job there. The whole organization's really good. And the team's outstanding. So. It was really difficult, uh, but uh, you know what? We just we just talked to the process and our plan, and we couldn't worry too much about them. And I thought I thought we did a great job against a really really great hockey team. 
here with GM Mike Oak. Mike, we talked in the last round, you know, getting through that tough North Bay series. It was a grind coming back in that series and then being able to close out this tough London Knights team. Just how proud are you of this group coming together when they needed to the most in the playoffs and taking down the two top seeds in the Eastern Conference to get here and then the London Knights? Well, at the end of the day, I really think we played four very, very good hockey clubs. We started with Sudbury, who have a tremendous team, big, strong, physical. Uh, we moved on to Ottawa, who we've had a lot of great battles with. And, uh, you know, really at the end of the day, we felt we were lined up against them back when the season was canceled. And then, uh, you know, and then in North Bay, a team much like ourselves built for the playoffs. They made a lot of real strong moves. Uh, for our group to go back uh, up there and win game seven uh, shows the, you know, really the, the uh, commitment of our players and our coaches. And then London, I mean, London have, are a perennial uh, contender uh, to go into a real hostile environment and be able to win a game there. Uh, and then be able to, you know, make sure that we took care of things here at home. And uh, we had a great, uh, you know, uh, some real adversity. The players tonight and the coaches put together a game plan and stuck to it. Uh, but, at, you know, one, one group that really deserves a lot of credit are the 4,100 people that were here tonight. They really pushed us through, uh, right through to the finish line. And uh, it, it's an awesome feeling. And I'm really proud of the players, the coaches, and I'm super excited for the entire city. I know you wanted to win game five in London because you got to close it out whenever you can. But just how important was it to win here game six, to not have to go back to London for that game seven? Here, glorious. Here, the fans go nuts here in Peterborough. They've rallied around this team and gotten the city excited about the Peterborough Peets again, champions for the first time in 15 years. Just how special is that for your group to be able to bring that home here? Well, it's 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 nice and it's exciting to win a championship no matter where you are, but to do it at home in front of all your family, all your friends, and all of your fans, uh, it, it's 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 uh, it's awesome. It's indescribable. You still see here, uh, long after the final horn, the number of fans that are still with us uh, and the families that are now out in the ice. Uh, it's an awesome feeling. And last question, you do it with some homegrown talent, Chase Stillman, J.R. Avon, local products. I know in 1920, a lot of people wanted those players from you. You made sure you kept those players. Just how special is that to build some players that ended up becoming, you know, great Peterborough Peets and OHL champions that, you know, are from this area. Yeah, you know what, it's, uh, we got a great group of players. Uh, the ones that we've drafted, our scouts deserve a lot of credit. Uh, we've built this team through the draft, made some key acquisitions. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at the makeup of our roster, we've got players that we took early in the draft, but we got lots of players that we took later in the draft uh, and, and, and through free agency, et cetera, in the U18 draft. Our scouts deserve a lot of credit for identifying the talent. The coaches put together a game plan and the players executed. And when you can do that, uh, it, it equals success. With JR Avon, JR, homegrown talent here in Peterborough. You've been here through all the ups and downs and this team building to this moment. They, you know, when they went forward in 1920, they, they said, you know, JR, we're keeping them. We're not moving on from them. Just how important was that for you and just how much did you want to bring a championship to this city because you're basically a hometown guy? Yeah, from uh, day one of OHL draft, I wanted to bring a championship to this city. Um, you know, it has been a has been a bit of a battle uh, with, uh, with the record we had in the last couple of years. So it's been really hard. COVID really screwed everything up. But, you know, um, with the guys we had here tonight, I couldn't have done it with anyone else. They were, they were awesome. I love every single one of them like a brother. And Chase Stillman, you grew up with him in minor hockey, just doing this together. Just how special was that for two homegrown guys being able to have this moment together and growing up, uh, you know, as little uh, young players in this in hockey? Yeah, you know, it was awesome. You know, um, actually, when we first met, we butt heads a little bit, but you know, I think we're best buddies now. Um, he's an amazing guy, amazing player. You know, I, I love him to death. So it's been awesome to win it with him. I made a little joke saying, uh, you know kind of sad it's the first thing we won in our whole career together but uh you know i couldn't have asked for anything else and last question for you jr just how special was this to do this on home ice i know you guys wanted to do it in game five in london but having it back at the bmc and having this community just rally around this team just how special has this playoff run been <laughs> you know uh, honestly it's crazy um everyone of course wants to win it as quick as you can but to win it in front of your fans is 
Because honestly, I, would, uh, I wouldn't trade a thing in for it. It's amazing. Here with Brennan Offman. Brennan, I know you got close last year. Flint lost in the conference final. Just how sweet was this to come back with redemption with the Peets this year, win that OHL championship? Just how does that redemption feel for you? Yeah, it's special for sure. I've won. Uh, I've been fortunate to win a lot of championships, and this is uh, this is up there to be the one of the best. And you know, I said when I was 16 years old that I wanted to win a championship in this league, and uh, it was so close last year. I almost could taste it, and you know what? We came up short, and. This year, uh, today is so special, and you know, I'm going to enjoy this. We're all going to enjoy this. Just how much motivation was it when you were up with the New York Rangers, you know, get sent back just the week before the season, to come back motivated to play well in this junior hockey league and get traded to a great team like Peterborough and get engraved with, uh, with your great teammates and be able to come together as a team and win it all? Yeah, it was great. Uh, I, I came back the day of my game, uh, opening day, and you know what, the boys in Flint have been texting me, and. Wish me not the best of luck, but I'm going to celebrate with these guys here. These guys are, it's such a special group we have, and uh, we came together at the right time, and that's why, we're, we, that's why we won today. And last question, just how big was it to win on home ice? I know you wanted to win game five in London, but, you know, hearing glorious play and hearing the fans go nuts here at the PMC, just how special is that moment, being able to win it on home ice? Yeah, they deserve it. They've been, they've been loyal all year, and, you know, we were the underdogs in every playoff series, and... Uh, they stuck behind us and they knew that we were going to win and you know what, they deserve this and you know what, we're going to enjoy this tonight, they're going to enjoy this tonight and we're going to go win a Memorial Cup. Here with goaltender Michael Simpson, playoff MVP. Michael, you, you held your team in there all series long against this tough London Knights team, being able to grind out a 2-1 win in game six to close it out. Just uh, talk about tonight and just the emotions of, uh, of this whole moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to put into words. I think there's so many emotions going through right now. Just so much joy, so much excitement, but you know, I don't think uh, I don't think it's 2-1 without some of the blocks we had. You know, some guys, you know, diving in front of the pucks. I think Donald probably had the biggest save of the game in the second period there, and you know, um, it's just it's just crazy. It's so surreal, and uh, I wouldn't have wanted to want it with another group of guys. And just talk about the road to get here. You take down the top two teams in the Eastern Conference, Ottawa and North Bay, to get here, and then you're going up against you know a great coach, London Knights team. Just talk about that grind of being able to really come out with the strong series against those three tough teams. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, pretty crazy. I think, you know, a lot of people have us have the underdog in every series, and, you know, we just uh, just kept kind of grinding and um, kept working, and just I think it shows a lot of character and the character of this room. I think, you know, that no-quit attitude we had all playoffs, I think, you know, we had a ton of uh, third-period comeback wins, and it's just it's so crazy. It's so hard to put into words. And those guys in front of you just talk about, you know, you watch them grow as a group because you acquired a lot of great players, but sometimes doesn't necessarily coordinate into having the best team. How do you see the guys come together in the room there with all that great individual talent to really make this happen as Peterborough Peets? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, as soon as we brought in the guys, we always had, uh, you know, some good, a good bond and good, uh, you know, friendships between all the guys, but for some reason on the ice, it just wasn't clicking. And, you know, for, uh, for it to start clicking in the playoffs, I don't think we could ask for a better time for it to start. And, you know, um, it's, it's been a grind, and it's just, I'm just I'm so happy to win it with these guys. And I know you're going to celebrate this, but how long before your mindset switches to Cam Loops? Big tournament, Seattle Thunderbirds are a great team you're going to be going up against in the WHL. Just talk about, you know, how excited you are and how confident you are with this group that you guys can go in the Cam Loops and make some noise to win the Memorial Cup. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's going to be a fun night tonight, but... You know, tomorrow or Wednesday, I think we got to flip that mindset back on to, you know, it's time to work. And, um, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of talent at this uh, Memorial Cup. And I think, you know, we just need to play our game and, you know, keep playing the way we have all playoffs because, you know, we deserve to be there. And um, we're just super excited to uh, hopefully prove people wrong again. Here with Owen back. Owen, I know you wanted to be out there with the boys tonight, but, you know, talk about the grind of this team coming together, taking out some top teams on the way to get here, North Bay, Ottawa, London, just how... How exciting was that to, to really go through the gauntlet and be able to get it done? Yeah, I mean, I wanted more than anything to be out here with the guys tonight, but uh, you know what, we've, uh, we've proved all year that we can take down top teams, and uh, even if we're a little short. So um, yeah, the, the grind was unbelievable from these guys, uh, and it just makes it feel all that much better, having, having taken down all those top teams. It's been a crazy year for you, you know, the, everything that happened with the Montreal Canadiens, getting called up, you know, like getting drafted in the last year, and then getting traded from the Mississauga Steelheads, just what has the whirlwind of this last you know, year or two been for you to get to this moment as an OHL champion now? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, not much, there's not much more that uh, can really be accomplished in this year. Um, you know, 
we, uh, we've got our eyes set on the Memorial Cup now, and I think that would just cap it all off. And can you talk about just all these great individual players coming together? So many t NHL drafted players, but sometimes doesn't necessarily create the best team. Just talk about you guys coming together as a unit, knowing there's only one puck and you guys have to share it with all the great talent and wealth of, uh, of scorers that you have on the team and everybody playing a role to get to this point. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it kind of showed in the, uh, in the regular season there that we weren't completely bought in, but as soon as the playoffs hit, that all changed. Everybody bought in. Everybody was willing to play, play a role, whatever it was asked, uh, asked of them. And, you know, it all worked out and our, uh, our talent shone through and, um, you know, everything everything uh, unfolded as it should. And last question, what has it been about Coach Wilson's system that's really gotten you guys to buy in? He, he always says that he's miserable, he's hard on you guys sometimes, but being able to, you know, come out and know that the process was going to work and obviously it, it paid off in the end being OHL champions. Yeah, I mean, you know, not everybody was, uh, was, was fans of the system uh, when I first got here, but again, we all bought in and uh, we all knew it was going to work. So, like, deep down, you know, we really, we really knew it was going to work, and and we all bought in. And um, you know, all I, all I can say about the systems is, uh, is offense win, wins games, defense wins championships. Here with Tucker Robertson, Tucker, you tipped in that goal in the third period, the series clinching goal, OHL championship winning goal. Just talk about your emotions through that, and just the atmosphere at that point. Oh, it was a surreal feeling. Um, I didn't really see the play that well. I was kind of just facing the goalie and trying to battle to get some good position in front of the net. Uh, I picked my head up and I saw Donald kind of sip one in there. He made a great play and I was fortunate to get a stick on it. It kind of found its way in. So I'm super happy and oh my God, it's, it's an unreal feeling. You scored some big goals in the playoffs. Just what is it about playoff hockey that really elevates your game and makes you just take it to another level, being able to come through in the, in the biggest moments and you know the most intense moments? Yeah, I'm definitely a big game player. Uh, I show up in the big games and then I also like it when it gets gritty and physical. I can kind of play that style. So I think playoff hockey really suits my game and it's really fun to play. Can you guys talk about just, you know, being able to use Michael Simpson's performances a, as motivation to, to really go out and, and produce when you needed to? Just talk about the backbone that he's been for your team as the goaltender and, you know, coming away with the playoff MVP. Yeah, he's been he's been incredible for us all year. It's, it's been special to watch him. It's, he really is the best goalie in the league, and he's kept us in so many games that we have no business of being in. So if you look at the... Look at all our scores throughout the year. I think we haven't got blown out very much. Every game, every game's within one or two goals. So it's that it really shows how good a goal he's been for us. And building with this team over the last few years, just how special has that been? You know, last year you guys made it to the first round, ran into that juggernaut Hamilton Bulldogs team. Just what did you guys learn from that experience and losing a playoff series to come back now as OHL champions? Yeah, we learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of things to correct, and we gained a lot of experience. We had, I think, like 17, 18 new guys and. Uh, it was a really new team, so just kind of getting some playoff experience under under our feet and then picking up Hazy and Whitey and Becker and Otter just to grab a ton of playoff experience really helped our group and really helped us keep calm throughout the playoffs. So I think everyone did a really good job. And last question, just how, how much are you guys going to celebrate this but know the job isn't done? Still got to go to Kamloops and, you know, compete for the Memorial Cup. Going up against some really tough teams, Quebec is out there, Seattle, they're great teams. And just how much do you think that your team is going to match up against some of those other great championship winning teams in Canada? Yeah, I think we're going to celebrate really hard tonight. I, I think it's going to be a really fun night and then we're going to get back to work. We know the job's not done yet. We've won, but we're not done. And uh, really excited to get out to Kamloops, play some really good hockey teams and hopefully win the Memorial Cup. Here with back-to-back -back OHL champion Gavin White. Gavin, a little bit of deja vu here. You know, you won with Hamilton last year. Obviously, they went in a different direction this year. Traded you and Avery Hayes here to Peterborough. Just how special was it to go and win with this group now and this year? Yeah, uh, you know, at, at, at the trade deadline, I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity, uh, you know, from the Peets. And we started off kind of rough. And, uh, you know, not, not many people believed in us, but in our group, you know, we really believed in, uh, in ourselves. And uh, when it got to playoff time, everybody, everybody put their heads down. I'm just, I'm just so proud of these guys. Um, you know, couldn't have done in a better city. Uh, you know, hockey town, there's not many left. Um, pretty special to a group of these guys in the city. Not many players even make it to one OHL championship, let alone win two. Just can you talk about just how special that is to for your name to be on that cup two years in a row, and you know be able to do it with Avery Hayes and come over and just provide so much you know knowledge and knowing what it takes to and the grind to get to this point that, for, that you did with last year. Yeah, um, you know one, one of my buddies about five minutes ago just told me and he looked it up and said there was 32 guys that had won uh, back to back um, before tonight, and now there's 34. Um, you know, and me and Avery are brothers for life, and uh, you know we're best friends on and off the ice. And um, you know, it's just 
It's almost, it's honestly unbelievable. I don't think it's really sunk in yet, uh, you know. But tonight we're gonna have a great time and uh, you know get after it in Kamloops. And just how, how special was that? And you know, difficult, but at the same time, fun to go against some of your teammates. You know, you guys were battling there, Ryan Winterton, uh, George Diaco, and obviously Ryan Humphrey likes to try to get under everybody's skin. So what was it about going up against those three guys and you know both battling for the same thing? You know. It was, uh, you know, we we, we, we kind of talked before we got traded. We were like, because we, we kind of knew this would happen and um, hoped it would happen, I guess. Um, you know, we kind of said, you know, friends off for that series. And, uh, you know, it came time and, uh, you know, both sides battled. And uh, thankfully, we really come out on top. And last question, just how special was it to do it, to do this at home in front of the fans here in Peterborough, getting the team excited about this franchise again. I know you wanted to win game five in London, but being able to close out that strong London Knights team just, what was the mindset, you know, going into this game and making sure that you guys closed it out on the home ice because you didn't want to go back to London for Game 7? Yeah, uh, no, you know, obviously the, the, the butt is a pretty tough building to, to win in. Uh, you know, for, we were fortunate enough to steal one earlier in the series, uh, which not many teams were able to do. And, um, you know, we, we came back home, you know, thinking, you know, this is the night. This is our, this is our Game 7. Um, we don't want to go back there, especially back-to-back -back nights. Um, you know, we just got to get the job done. Um, you know, our, we, had, we had a pretty defense-first mindset today, uh, trying to limit them as much as possible. And I think... Uh, we. We did a very good job of that. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Great interviews on the ice. A little bit of uh, different audio levels there because obviously with uh, the noise levels, uh, I had to make sure I was a little bit louder uh, in asking the questions. So I tried to make sure that the, the levels weren't, weren't too bad as, uh, as I'm talking to you here. But um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that and enjoyed this whole episode and enjoyed our, our coverage of the OHL playoffs for, for this season uh, with the Eastern Conference recap and here with the OHL finals recap. Great series with the London Knights and the Peterborough Peets. And hopefully uh, we can have more player interviews and uh, more coverage going forward here uh, on this show as a staple here on the network. Uh, and I appreciate all those who have been listening and following along with the content. Promise you big things are on the horizon uh, for this show as I uh, transition here uh, into the summer and then going into next season. Look look to uh, have a lot more episodes uh, for this podcast specifically here on the network. So thank you very much for tuning in and listening along for a lot of great interviews here for this episode. Some great insight there from the broadcasters. Let me give a quick shout out to Greg Sloan, Mike Stubbs, Pete Dalladay, and Mark Mathot for uh, for their in-depth interviews. And then as well, Mike O, Rob Wilson, and the uh, six player interviews that we had on the show as well after the celebra during the celebration for the Peterborough Pete. So until next time, my name is Brandon Caputo. You can follow me on Twitter at bcaputo underscore AGM. Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at Armchair GM Pod. And you can like us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok by searching the Armchair GM Sports Network. Until next time, this has been OHL Overtime right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Enjoy the summer, guys, and we'll be talking more OHL very very soon you're listening to the armchair gm sports network